So the day has finally come. After today, I will have finally read every single story in Fazbear Frights. I didn't read the final epilogue until making today's video, and if you haven't gathered from the title or from what I said in my last Fazbear Frights video, I literally reread every single Fazbear Frights epilogue and noted interesting details I noticed in each and every one. While I will continue with Fazbear Frights videos, my future ones will be about revisiting old ones that I've already read and trying to find new details. But this video will be my final Fazbear Frights video before Tales from the Pizzaplex comes out. Or at least my final Fazbear Frights video looking at details. I will be doing a tier list for my opinions on every single story in the future, probably coming out tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. But this video will be a bit different to some of my other Fazbear Frights videos. See, in my other ones, I always talk about the details and then discuss a theory I made based on the story at the end of the video. But the Stitch Wraith epilogues are a bit different. The whole Stitch Wraith story has a lot of the theory fodder. A lot of ideas come from the Stitch Wraith story, so it's kind of hard to put all of that at the end of one video. Instead, any theories I come up with will just be restrained within the details rather than separated. Anyways, I don't want to waste any more time, let's get into it. Number 1. While the first few epilogues don't have all that much interesting about them, there are a couple details that are very much worth mentioning. For example, when the Stitch Wraith kills people, their bodies wither and their eyes bleed black. More interestingly, by the time of the first epilogue, there are five people dead. When the missing children die in the minigames of, of the FNAF games, their bodies turn grey, obviously to indicate that they are now ghosts, but it's interesting because dead bodies turn grey over time. When the kids die, they keep dark grey or black tears on their faces. This is just like the Stitch Wraith victims, and it becomes more interesting when you consider that William Afton is in the Stitch Wraith, and he is the one who actually kills people. And since obviously William killed the missing kids, it's interesting that these bodies are similar. Number 2. While the real Jake in pretty much every epilogue from 3 and onward clearly tell us that the Stitch Wraith is not entered, it is still fairly interesting that they do have some similar design details, like a white face and with a blacked out eye, and the fact that the Stitch Wraith is described to have a shambling walk, which entered definitely has in the fake ending of Sister Location. Number 3. In the second epilogue, I didn't really find any interesting details. I did notice a couple things, but they aren't really interesting to epilogue 2 alone but they come into, into play around Epilogue 8, which I'll get to after. But Stitch Wraith 3 is fairly interesting. It's mentioned that Larson and his son look alike, but he and his son don't have a great relationship. Larson loved his son, but work always got in the way. Larson is also divorced. I feel like maybe this is meant to be a reflection of Mike and William. I don't believe it's a parallel, because it is two completely different scenarios, but I feel like the relationship issues could be a reflection of Mike and William's. It's kind of the opposite of how Mike and William are, where Mike, at least at the beginning of the timeline, loved his father but just wanted to impress him, but he failed to impress William, who never really cared for Mike. The opposite can be said about Larson, who loves his son and wants to have good, good times with him, but work always gets in the way and he fails to have a good relationship with him, and Ryan, his son, is always upset by this. Number 4. I think pretty much everyone knows this about the Stitch Wraith epilogues, but I feel like, at least in Epilogue 3, it's largely ignored. The Stitch Wraith is spotted at what is described as an old site where a bizarre fire took place. This is of course referring to the FNAF 6 fire. While you all know I do not believe the Stitch Line games, I think it's very clear that the events of the games did, for the most part, happen in the Stitch Line, most especially FNAF 6. And in Epilogue 7, Larson has an evidence bag from this fire and inside it is the puppet. And in Epilogue 5, it was stated that the, that the fire was never solved, but that it was connected to one of the founders of Fazbear Entertainment, meaning Henry, meaning that this is definitely the FNAF 6 fire. Number 5. In Epilogue 3, it's said that Phineas believes the term haunted can, but also doesn't always, have to refer to a ghost. Talbert in the final epilogue says that Remnant is haunted metal. Since these two were partners and friends, it seems like they would have the same definition of the word haunted. So it seems that, while Remnant can contain souls, as does the Remnant in, in the fun times, it doesn't always have to. It can also contain certain emotions or powerful memories or anything supernatural or paranormal. But I'll discuss the description of Remnant more when we talk about the final epilogue at the end of the video. Number 6. Phineas has a bunch of items in his room, such as a bunch of torture devices including the wheel, also known as the breaking wheel, which is also talked about in another Fazbear Fright story also named the breaking wheel. 
it makes a lot of sense for torture devices to be here since Phineas is stug studying agony, and I don't think I have to explain why torture devices would have a lot of agony. Phineas also has a lot of other stuff too, interestingly including non-animatronic dolls that are able to open their eyes all by themselves. Gives me Annabelle vibes. But it reminded me of something I remember taking note of and mentioning back when I did one of these Fazer Fights videos on Count the Ways. Millie's grandfather is a collector, kinda like Phineas, and he has some strange porcelain dolls that Millie thought were really creepy. Since we know the Stitch Fright stories take to take place after the events of Count the Ways, it's very possible that Phineas got these dolls from Millie's grandpa, or possibly got the same type of dolls, but different ones, that specifically ones that were haunted. Number 7. There are quite a few connections to Fetch in the third epilogue. First, Phineas believes flowers are the most affected by emotions than anything else. In Fetch, Greg has plants that he believes react to emotional energy. REGs are also mentioned, and Fetch has an REG machine to translate human messages and text into binary code. And finally, we of course have the appearance of the Fetch animatronic, and most importantly its battery pack being a part of the Stitch Wraith. Number 8. Speaking of the Fetch animatronic, when Phineas gets ready to disassemble it and put the battery pack into the endoskeleton, he senses that Fetch had been responsible for a serious amount of agony. This is not only because of what happened in the Fetch story, but also because Fetch is possessed by Andrew, who causes a tremendous amount of agony by being responsible for the man in room 1280. Number 9. In the first epilogue, when Larson finds out there are five withered bodies with black tear tracks down their faces, it's familiar to him. As it turns out, he'd had a case of that before these five. In Epilogue 3, the Stitch Wraith accidentally kills Phineas, and causes him to bleed black from his eyes and his body to wither as well. Phineas's friend finds his body and calls the police, who believe he was killed by an electrical discharge. Larson was one of the officers that arrived to investigate Phineas's death, and the one other case of these withered bodies and black tear tracks that Larson remembered was Phineas. This was confirmed in Epilogue 5, and the reason I'm bringing it up here is that the Phineas murder by the Stitch Wraith happened before all the other five, and is separate from them. This seems very similar to how Charlotte was killed separate from the missing kids and before them. She was the first victim that William directly killed. <laughs> Number 10. Epilogue 4 is pretty short, but very interesting. When Jake finds himself in the Stitch Wraith, he knows that he used to be a little boy, but he can't remember much, and Andrew's memories are also a bit faded. This will come into play in an idea I have about the Stitch Wraith, but I'll get to that in a little bit. I'm mentioning this because the two spirits in the survival logbook also seem to have faded memories which I'll get to in a second. This is the idea that I have about the Stitch Wraith, and, I'll, and like I said, I'll get to that in a little bit. Number 11. When Andrew first talks to Jake, Jake thinks he recognizes Andrew's voice as a kid from school who always talked back to the teacher. This completely screws over Stitch Line games. An issue with Stitch Line games is that in Into the Pit, it's presented that there are six victims in the missing children incident, despite there only being five, which we know for a fact. The excuse for this is that Into the Pit isn't a completely accurate representation of the missing children incident, and Andrew actually died earlier in the timeline. But there's only two possibilities here. Either A, Andrew was in the Fazer Frights missing children incident, destroying Stitch Line games, or B, Andrew and Jake went to school together, also destroying Stitch Line games. See, Jake makes an appearance in Fetch, which takes place in modern day, after Freddy's is long abandoned. That means the real Jake does as well, meaning if Jake and Andrew went to school together, Andrew died in modern day. Since Andrew was killed by William, and in the game timeline William was trapped in a wall unable to kill anyone in modern day, that means Stitch Line games just can't be true. Number 12. Inside the Stitch Wraith, at least at the time of Epilogue 4, Andrew isn't able to see. In the survival logbook, in response to the question asked by the faded text saying, what do you see, the bite victim says, I can't see. And not only that, but this whole conversation between Andrew and Jake seems very rep reminiscent of the conversation in the logbook, with Jake asking a lot of questions and Andrew only responding to a select few. The Stitch Wraith is also occupied by Andrew, Jake, and Afton. Afton is the one who killed Andrew, and he stays silent throughout his time in the Stitch Wraith. Andrew seems to be a bite victim parallel in some regards and a parallel to the altered text, and Jake also seems to be a bite victim parallel but dis different aspects of the bite victim, with also being a parallel to the faded text. In the logbook, we have Michael, who doesn't respond to the faded or altered text, and also the killer of the bite victim, who is the altered text, and we have the faded text as well. While I have my own explanation for Andrew being both a parallel to Cassidy and the bite victim while them also being two separate people, that's going to have to wait for a video on the Man in Room 1280, which will probably be out sometime in August. 
but primarily I think Andrew is a Cassidy parallel, and Jake is a bite victim parallel. My point here is that I think the Stitch Wraith is meant to be a parallel, at least partially, to the survival logbook, but also something else which I'll get to in another detail. Number 13. One of the biggest reasons I believe Golden Duo is the new kid. Andrew is inside the Golden Freddy suit, meaning he clearly possesses him. But Kelsey also has many connections to Golden Freddy, and is clearly not alive and is just a spirit, he's a dead kid. Some people believe that Kelsey and Andrew are the same person. One argument is that in Epilogue 4, Jake asks if Andrew ever had someone to talk to, and Andrew said he didn't, meaning there weren't two spirits in Golden Freddy. But there is an explanation for this. See, the new kid takes place in modern day, but by the time of the story, Andrew would have already been attached to William or possibly even in the Stitch Wraith by now, so it's possible Kelsey was killed by a bully sometime in modern day, and that's why he gets revenge on bullies. And the fact that Andrew isn't in Golden Freddy at this point clearly proves that Kelsey isn't Andrew, meaning Golden Duo is almost definitely true. But under Stitch Line Games, Andrew not having anyone to talk to becomes problematic, because Andrew in the Stitch Wraith is clearly in Golden Freddy, and it's pretty much certain that Cassidy and the Bite Victim are the Bite Victim and it's pretty much certain that Cassidy and the Bite Victim are Golden Freddy in the games. Even if Cassidy and the Bite Victim are the same person, Andrew would have had someone to talk to because he shared a suit with them, but he doesn't in the Stitch Line, so this goes against Stitch Line games. Number 14. Further proof for Golden Duo comes from the line from Andrew, where he says that he doesn't want to kill people but only scare them. But in the new kid, Kelsey, Golden Freddy, literally chomps down on Devin's arm, and since he did that, I think it's very clear that since Devin is stuck here and can't escape, that he dies there, going against Andrew's character, implying Kelsey is someone else entirely. Number 15. The mission of the Stitch Wraith is for the Cassidy parallel and the Bi Victim parallel to destroy all the objects that have been infected by Afton. In Princess Quest, we have Cassidy being instructed by Old Man Consequences to go around and destroy all the glitch traps, and since there's so many, it seems clear that these represent objects the glitch trap has spread throughout. I made a theory a while ago about Princess Quest, and another one about Happiest Day, and in those videos I proposed that Old Man Consequences could be the Bite Victim. So we have a Cassidy parallel and a Bite Victim parallel in a body along with Afton infecting objects and the Cassidy and Bite Victim parallels destroying the objects that are infected by Afton in the Stitch Wraith. And we have Cassidy and the Bite Victim along with Glitch Trap, and Cassidy and the Bite Victim working to destroy all the objects infected with Glitch Trap. It feels like the Stitch Wraith is not only a parallel to the logbook, but was also set up and a parallel to Princess Quest. Number 16. The Stitch Wraith is very much a reference to Frankenstein's monster, which is even called out in Epilogue 5. Based on the description of the endoskeleton in Epilogue 3 and the image of the Stitch Wraith in the Ultimate Guide, we know the Stitch Wraith has an Endo-02. If we look at Dreadbear's model in FNAF VR, we see that he actually has a modified Endo-02 as well. Dreadbear is a character based on Frankenstein's monster as well, which seems to indicate a connection between Dreadbear and the Stitch Wraith, but that's obviously not certain. And even if there is a connection, I have no idea about what it is, but I felt it was worth mentioning. Number 17. At the end of Epilogue 5, Jake is almost sucked out of the Stitch Wraith and into just being set free, but he doesn't want to be because he wanted to continue helping Andrew. In my Happiest Day video, I discussed the theory I had, and I feel like this epilogue kind of confirms it. Or it doesn't confirm it, but it strongly hints at it. I believe that the bio victim could have just been set free in Happiest Day, but stayed behind, offering to let William go through Ultimate Custom Night and watch over him, offering to give up his spot in Happiest Day so Cassidy could be set free. The only difference here would be that Jake succeeds in setting Andrew free, and Jake is stuck in the Stitch Wraith. Number 18. Andrew has some level of control in the Stitch Wraith, which confirmed a suspicion I had. See, in the blob, the puppet mask is missing its tear tracks, and the eyes are not glowing. In the security puppet minigame from FNAF 6, the puppet has no tear tracks before it was possessed by Charlotte. This has led many people to believe that the puppet is not in the blob and is possibly set free at this point. But the thing is, the blob has tentacles that look and move similar to the way Nightmare Ion's tentacles do, and the puppet in Near the Band also has tentacles, so it really seems like the puppet is controlling the blob's tentacles. Since we know Andrew was possessing the fetch battery pack, but he can also control the endoskeleton, we know that spheres can move themselves into other objects. It's probably only able to happen with things that are in close proximity to what is already being possessed, but it's very possible that Charlotte just isn't possessing the puppet body anymore and has moved her spirit into the wires of the blob. Number 19. Towards the end of Epilogue 6, Larson mentions how the Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center is where William Afton died. This is kind of inconsistent, considering the fact that in the Man in Room 1 to 80, no one knew who the man was, so how would people know William died here? Number 20. 
Larson also refers to Afton as a serial killer notorious for wearing a rabbit suit. In the unused FNAF AR Fast Facts, it's actually revealed that for the most part, William Afton is a famous man, because although we, he was suspected of murders, the children's bodies were never found so he couldn't be convicted for murder, and his reputation managed to remain mostly unaffected, at least to the public eye. But in the Stitch Line, William is a known serial killer, because in Into the Pit and Near the Band, it's revealed that the children that, that were killed were found, meaning William could be convicted. Number 21. While the Afton Amalgamation is a vaguely human-shaped monster and not just shaped like a mound, the Afton Amalgamation and the Blob have a bit in common. First of all, designs. In Princess Quest, Afton looks nothing like Glitch Trap or Burn Trap, but he has a bunch of strange faces and shapes on him. A while ago, I made a comparison between this version of Afton and the Blob. At the end of Princess Quest, he also reaches out to Cassidy with tentacles just like the ones that the Blob has. It seems like in the games, Afton will become the Afton Amalgamation in the future by combining with the Blob. While the game Afton Amalgamation is very different to the book one, it still seems like it was what they were setting up, with the Afton Amalgamation in the books being an early hint as to what we could expect from the future. Number 22. The Afton Amalgamation is stated to be about 15 feet tall, which is about the same height as Molten Freddy, who also is in the Blob, and the Blob is pretty big, showing that it's probably 15 feet tall too, connecting it further to the Afton Amalgamation. Number 23. It's also stated that not only were the parts of the Afton Amalgamation being used as his body, but they were under his control. In the Blob, most of the animatronic heads have red eyes, implying they are being controlled by one specific entity, except Baby and Puppet, who don't have red eyes, implying that they are separate, probably with the Puppet controlling the wires and Baby doing whatever the hell she's doing. Number 24. When Larson was chasing the Afton Amalgamation in Epilogue 7, the sounds made by it in evolved into some sort of squishing sound, similar to that of organs being removed from a body. This made me think, what if Fazgoo had been a part of the Afton Amalgamation? It's really the only thing I can think of for how this sound could have been made. Number 25. Also while chasing Afton, Larson sees large shadows moving along the walls in front of him. These shadows weren't from the Afton Amalgamation, they were from something else. This detail is not mentioned again and is super random, but we know from Hide and Seek, the 10th epilogue, and You're the Band that Eleanor is the shadow, and since she's a part of the Afton Amalgamation, it's likely that she's, these shadows are her, but it's also possible that it's actually something else, which brings me to my next detail. Number 26. The Puppet Mask makes whisper sounds throughout this epilogue and also the 6th. In the real Jake, Margie hears whispers coming from Jake's room right before he died. Because of this 7th epilogue, it's now confirmed that those whispers were from the Puppet, who is likely responsible for Jake possessing Simon. Even more interestingly, however, is the fact that the Puppet shares the whisper feature with none other than Shadow Bonnie from FNAF AR. Is it possible that Shadow Bonnie was made up of the agony from Charlotte's death? I mean, Shadow Bonnie actually helped set up Happiest Day. Whenever I bring this up, I get a lot of comments saying that it isn't Shadow Bonnie, because it's not like Fredbear and Balloon Boy set up Happiest Day. But the difference is that Shadow Bonnie glitches through all the other minigames, implying he has some sort of control here. It's almost as if Shadow Bonnie is the main spirit setting up Happiest Day, or is at least connected to that spirit. And not only that, but what if Shadow Bonnie is the cause of the shadows on the wall? Or maybe, since there seems to have been multiple of them, one was Shadow Bonnie and one was Eleanor. Number 27. It's said that what Larson puts in the evidence bag was the puppet's mask, not the puppet's body. But somehow, the puppet manages to use its body. Black and white stripes are mentioned multiple times in the epilogue 7. That's really weird that despite the body not being around, the puppet can just summon the body somehow? I don't really understand, it's just really weird. Number 28. A lot of Stitch Line games believers think that the Blob is the remains of the Afton Amalgamation, but this simply cannot be true. First of all, literally the entirety of the Afton Amalgamation remained, and none of that included a 15 foot wide and tall mountain of wires. And for that matter, it didn't even include Mangle, Chica, Bonnie, Baby, and probably not Funtime Freddy. Literally the only animatronic in the Blob that was also in the Afton Amalgamation was Puppet, that's all. And that's not even mentioning that all of this stuff is at the bottom of a lake. And if you want to argue that it could have been retrieved, why would anybody do that? Why would Fazbear Entertainment do that if they were just going to bury it and never use it again anyway? It doesn't make sense. Number 29. In the 8th epilogue, Larson was seeing visions of the ball pit without even going into it. It was like it was reaching out to him. In Into the Pit, Oswald, before seeing the ball pit, had started drawing the Freddy's animatronics before having seen them. 
It seems like the ball pit just reaches out to people. More interestingly though, Larson seems to have gotten these visions due to Eleanor and the Afton Amalgamation infecting him, since Eleanor is connected to the ball pit, so it's interesting that the ball pit does the same thing to Oswald despite him not being infected by anything. I mean, it's not weird that the pit reaches out to him when he's not infected, it's just kind of weird that it reaches out to him in the same way. Number 30. When Jake is walking around the, in the rain, he finds a man with a tangled beard and long hair lying on the ground. This fits the description of Grimm that we get in the second Vazor Frights epilogue. He's a homeless man with long hair and a beard. Number 31. This detail is probably pretty obvious, but I wanted to bring it up anyway. When Jake accidentally touches this guy, he expects him to die. Jake thinks he accidentally killed him, because that's what happened every time he's touched someone before. But this guy, probably Grimm, didn't die. This is because Afton was the one causing people to die when the Stitch Wraith touched them. But here, Afton is gone, no longer in the Stitch Wraith, so there's no one in the Stitch Wraith that, that kills anymore. Number 32. Jake gives probably Grimm his happiest day. He basically just takes a happy memory from his mind and makes it the biggest memory, a happy one. He makes the memory the most prominent in probably Grimm's mind. In FNAF 3, Happy's Day is the same layout as Fredbear's from FNAF 4, just flipped. It seems like maybe the Bite Victim and Charlotte together, in setting up Happiest Day, took the Bite Victim's good memory of his birthday party, the part of the party before the bullies came and accidentally killed him, and did to the Bite Victim what Jake did to Grimm. The difference is that Happiest Day is made for the Bite Victim, but it's also made to set everyone free, so it takes a lot more work. Making the memory bigger is part of it, but there's a lot of extra steps to free everyone else along with the Bite Victim. Number 33. Jake compares the process of giving probably Grimm his happiest day to blowing up a balloon. This is very interesting because in Happiest Day, the balloons above the kids represent their spirits, which we know based on the fact that they're, as they're set free, the balloons rise. Also unrelated to the Stitch Wraith, but related to the balloons, we see the main missing kids and Charlotte in Happiest Day, but we also see five more dead kids wearing mediocre Melodies masks. That's 11 victims. These victims seem to be completely different than victims that we've never seen before. Then we also see five more balloons that represent the Save Them kids, despite us not seeing them. But my point is that there's 16 total victims, because there's 16 total balloons. So who are these five mediocre melody ones? Well, I made a theory a while back around December talking about my theory on what it could be. Though I disagree with a lot of that video in hindsight, I still stand by the main subject of the theory, and I think it's pretty interesting. Number 34. Jake is a character who, just like Steve Rogers, I don't want to kill anyone. I don't like bullies. When Jake sees two men bullying a teenage girl, he beats the crap out of those guys. It's also mentioned in the real Jake that he once stood up to a bully but got a black eye. This could be trying to further indicate that Jake is a bite victim parallel, since the bite victim is a heavily bullied character, and the entirety of the FNAF 4 gameplay is him getting back at his greatest bully, Michael. 35. We all know that the restaurant Larson finds the ball pit in is Jeff's Pizza. This is obvious just from Into the Pit. But the man who lets Larson into the building also matches Jeff himself quite a bit. He's described as a tired looking old man. It's also mentioned that the restaurant has yellow walls but you can see shapes peeking through the bad paint job. This is mentioned in Into the Pit as well. Number 36. The balls in the ball pit are also covered in blood, which I'll talk about in another detail in a second. The interesting thing is though that the balls in Into the Pit are also said to be sticky, meaning that they already have the blood on them at this point. This means that the blood couldn't have been from Oswald as I believed it to be before I found this out. Number 37. Jake brings the girl to a shed by the train tracks. This is the same shed from Epilogue 2 that Grimm was hiding in when he saw the Stitch Wraith. It's also the, sa the same tracks from Out of Stock, as we know from the fact that the Stitch Wraith was grabbing the parts of the Plush Trap Chaser in the second epilogue. Number 38. The 30 blood samples Larson sent had been from the same person from 30 different time periods. In the final epilogue, it's revealed that Eleanor had used the pit to store her victims. It's also mentioned in the 10th epilogue that the time periods that the blood samples come from coincided with Eleanor's victims going missing. But the fact that this blood is from the same person means it can't be from her victims. So whose blood is this? Genuinely, I have no idea. Or do I? I actually do have an idea, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Number 39. A misconception about the blood is that it had come from the past 30 years, placing the Stitch Wraith stories in 2015. But this isn't the case. First of all, that doesn't up, add up timeline-wise, and second of all, it says 30 different time periods. It doesn't say the past 30 years. Number 40. To make sure these blood results are accurate, Larson called someone in the lab named Tabitha. Tabitha is the name of the girl that goes to school with Toby in Hide and Seek. Is it possible it's the same Tabitha? Who knows. 
Number 41. I think most people know this, but if you say Rennell backwards, it's actually Eleanor. But this is interesting because Rennell is an actual real girl, so that's a bit strange. Did Eleanor specifically name herself after Rennell, or is this just a coincidence in universe? Interestingly, Jake feels like Rennell being her name is a half-truth, which is technically true because Rennell is her name, but backwards. Jake also thinks Rennell's name doesn't really fit her. That's because Eleanor is using the body of the drug addict and using the name and past of a completely separate girl, the real Rennell. Number 42. Although Eleanor isn't Elizabeth in the stitch line, she is using the past of Rennell, who is the daughter of Dr. Talbert. Dr. Talbert is a scientist who studies and experiments with Remnant. Talbert lost his wife and after that he just didn't care much about his child anymore. He only focused on his work. Sounds a lot like William Afton. This is what initially got me believing that the reason William Afton got sent into insanity is partially because of the death of his wife, which seemed to be further hinted at and partially confirmed in Security Breach. Talbert also had a partner who created an endoskeleton that ended up killing him. Sounds a lot like Henry in the novel trilogy, further hinting that Talbert is William since his partner parallels Henry. Number 43. I actually got this detail from Krakoa back when Gumdrop Angel first came out. The name Eleanor means shining light. At the end of the 8th epilogue, when it's revealed that Rennell is Eleanor, a beam of bright light lands on her. Shining light lands on Eleanor. Number 44. The 10th epilogue has a lot less hidden details than I expected it would, but one of the things Larson does see is step closer. He sees Pete on his operating table, eyes wide open and unable to be closed, with two guys getting ready to take his organs. Behind Pete is actually Eleanor. Despite Pete being dead, it seems like he possessed his own body, but the reason he can't move in it is because Eleanor is literally holding him down by the shoulders. Number 45. Right after seeing Pete, Larson makes his way to the man in room 1 to 80. This shows that Eleanor is actually partially the cause of this version of Ultimate Custom Night. In the man in room 1 to 80, it's said that there are two separate people's brainwaves inside Afton's head fighting for control. This could either mean Andrew and William or Andrew and Eleanor, but in Princess Quest, it's literally confirmed that Cassidy is involved with Ultimate Custom Night, and if there's only a maximum of, of two spirits causing Ultimate Custom Night, Stitch Line games cannot be the case. I swear I'm not looking for ways to debunk it, they just come to me. Somehow those are the only two details I was able to find in Epilogue 10. I would have expected it to be packed. Number 46. Now we're getting into the last epilogue I haven't read until now. At the beginning of the final epilogue, Jake is forced into a fake memory of his ninth birthday party, surrounded by his friends. This is most likely a reference to Jake being a bite victim parallel and the bite victim's happiest day. Since the bite victim's happiest day is his birthday party with him surrounded by the missing kids in Charlotte, who are established to be his friends, it seems very similar. Number 47. Eleanor is able to shoot tentacles out of her mouth, which is very strange, but they're black like the blob but made out of blood. This might be the answer of who's blood is in the pit. The dates of the blood correspond with the dates that people went missing because of Eleanor, but it couldn't have been her victim's blood because the blood was all from the same person, so maybe the blood came from something else that interacted with the pit when she stored her victims there. It's Eleanor's blood. How she has blood, I have no idea. Maybe it's fake blood, or maybe she had someone's, someone else's blood like infused into her in order to be created. Who the fuck? Who the hell knows? Number 48. Every time Larson is brought into the other world, he finds Eleanor in a trunk. Or not every time, but two times. He finds Eleanor in a trunk. In the fourth closet, Charlie is also found in a trunk, similar to the FNAF 4 box. At the end of the epilogue, it's also revealed that the girl Eleanor took over, the drug addict from the 8th epilogue, was also stored in a trunk. I had a theory that I mentioned in my 1.35am video that the Charlie bots existed in the stitch line, but when Henry discovers Charlie possesses the puppet, he stops working on them, and because he stops working on them, Afton never finds it, and Elizabeth never possesses it. Since before Elizabeth possessed it in the fourth closet, it was possessed by anger and insanity from Henry, if the fourth bot had no spirit to balance it out, maybe that fourth bot could have went on to become Eleanor. Maybe that's why she's in a trunk here just like the Charlie Bot 3 was, because this is Charlie Bot 4, the Stitch Line version. Number 49. A lot of people still argue that You're the Band is not in the Stitch Line, but it so very clearly is. Not only does Eleanor appear in the story, but Timmy's bedroom appears in the final epilogue. The third time Larson is sent into the other world, he wakes up in a bedroom with a baseball bat and a light blue race car bed, plus a poster of Freddy and Friends on the wall. 
Before Timmy was born, his father went out and bought a soccer ball and a baseball bat for him as soon as he could. Bef for his birthday party, Sylvia drew a poster of Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica that had said Freddy and friends say happy birthday Timmy. Plus, when Larson arrives in this room, it reminds him of when he used to look under his son's bed to make sure there were no monsters. Eleanor comes out of the closet in this scene as well. In You're the Band, when Timmy first sees the shadow, who is Eleanor, Sylvia looks under the bed for monsters and in the closet as well. I don't think it was ever stated whether or not Timmy has a race car bed, but everything else adds up. So one thing is for certain, this is Timmy's bedroom. Number 50. When Jake kills Eleanor, her body was withered, dry, dead, and completely empty. At the end of Into the Pit, the exact same thing happens to Into the Spit. Into the Spit? What the hell is that? That would be a terrible story. At the end of Into the Pit, the exact same thing happens to Into the Pit Spring Bonnie. He is suffocated by the net around the ball pit and his body becomes withered and empty. Number 51. Here's the quote of Talbert explaining Remnant. Quote, Remnant is... He paused. In non-scientific terms, it's like the metal is haunted. It's more complicated than that, of course, but it's similar to the way that water conducts electricity. Remnant is the mixing of the tangible with the intangible, of memory with the present. The people and things that are lost, it makes them almost real again. Tower had a sad, faraway look in his eyes. You know, when Renell was a little girl, she was sick. She was in and out of the hospital on an almost constant basis. I was scared, terrified really, that she would die. I stayed up nights trying to think of ways to protect her. I made this little pendant for her out of remnant. That way I figured I could never lose her entirely." End quote. After this came out, I really don't know why people still argue about what remnant is. Talbert flat out says that remnant is haunted metal. I'm mentioning this to clear up the misconception that remnant was discovered by William Afton or that it's some kind of energy. That's not the case. Remnant isn't something you can just discover. It's not natural. Remnant is something that has to be created. Remnant can be made from a metal with pretty much anything haunting it. Like I said before, Remnant is shown to be liquid in the 10th epilogue. This implies that Remnant has to be melted in order to create it. This is consistent with how we see it both in Phaser Frights and the Remnant in both the games in the 4th closet. Remnant is haunted and melted metal. It really can't be any simpler. It's not an energy. The remnant in FNAF AR is an exception, but it's not really pure remnant. The remnant in AR is just the energy wafting off the actual remnant metal. So there it is. Remnant is a metal. This is factual. When William melts the FNAF 1 endos together, he doesn't extract remnant from it and put it in the fun times. He turns the endoskeletons into remnant by melting it, and takes a tiny fraction of that remnant and puts it in each of the fun times. It's very simple. Number 52. When Larson asks Talbert what remnant is haunted by, he doesn't respond to the question, but gives Larson the pendant. This implies that him keeping the pendant will give him the answer to his question. When he is walking away from the house, the remnant pendant makes a high-pitched sound, and Larson realizes that it is singing. This seems to imply that this remnant is actually made by a spirit. But whose spirit is it? Who knows? Maybe it's from Talbert's wife, and that's the work that he dove into after she died. Number 53. The heart-shaped pendant is completely made of remnant, because of different states of matter and stuff. The remnant in a liquid form, or solid but malleable form, was welded into a heart shape completely out of remnant. There's no illusion disc. So how does Eleanor change appearances with the pendant? Can remnant just do that? I doubt it. So how does it work? I don't know. It's just something that I observed that doesn't make a lot of sense. And I mean, that's what this story series is about, I guess. Noting everything interesting that I n noticed, whether it makes sense or not. Number 54. This last detail is a bit of a spoiler for the first Tales from the Beats of X story, Frailty, so just a heads up. In Frailty, the Remnant Pendant makes a return. A lot of people believe this proves Stitchline games, but not only does this ignore the many, many flaws with Stitchline games, but it literally doesn't even prove anything. I am a firm believer that there will be a different version of Eleanor in the games moving forward, because it really seems like Eleanor, or rather Elizabeth in a new body, is patient 46. This would all mean that the Pendant exists in the games, whether Stitchline Games is true or not. But if Stitchline Games is true, there's not even any way for Jessica to get the Pendant. Larson has the Pendant, so how could Jessica have it? It doesn't make sense. But those are all the details I found in every single Stitch Wraith epilogue. This turned out to be an 11 page script and a really long video. The recording is 42 and a half minutes right now. 
it'll probably be shorter in the end but uh, but still it was a really long video a little really long recording really long script so i hope you all end up enjoying this video and if you did then please do leave a like and subscribe if you want to Stay tuned for future videos I have coming in the future as well, including my ideas for why I think the stories in Felix the Shark were scrapped, and my full tier list on every single Fazbear Frights story. But anyways guys, I hope you all enjoyed, and I'll see you all probably tomorrow for the Fazbear Frights ranking video. Bye guys!